Good morning and welcome to Live with Lewis for 24 June 2004. We're coming to you today from Labanit Park in Sugar Creek, Missouri. We're about uh, 20 minutes outside of Kansas City, just downstream from the uh, confluence of the Kaw and the Missouri Rivers at the area that actually forms the point where the city of St. Uh, excuse me, the city of Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas both come together there at that, uh, that confluence area and we'll be moving up there in the next few days. Today we're going to be talking about what's happened in the last week on the river, both historically as well as in a contemporary way once again. We last saw you on the 17th of June when we came to you live from Lexington, Missouri and that historic community there. And in just a few moments we're going to take a look at some of the footage that was shot as we move past that area. But we want to take a look as we do each week at what happened 200 years ago during the journals and as recorded in the journals during the original expedition. As you are aware, of many of the, uh, the information that Lewis was recording at this point is very sketchy. Um, his journals for this period were lost, and the information that we do have from him is largely celestial observations and that sort of thing, uh, including uh, the uh, information that he's recording for the triangulating their position so the map making can continue as they move through this region. Clark's journals, Ordway's journals, and uh, some, some other entries from some of the other men uh, provide us with the information we know at this area. When we last left you in the area of what is now Lexington, Missouri, we had been uh, talking about some of the weather issues that had continued to uh, plague the Corps as they moved up the river. They were passing, as you may remember, a particularly swift area with regard to current. There were also a number of issues regarding mosquitoes and ticks, and uh, which were persistent and ongoing issues. But at any rate, uh, basically in the journal this past week that the struggle continues to be with the river at this area. They're going through a series of bends. They're dealing with extremely high currents. They're starting to encounter some islands that are providing uh, actual several branches of the river passing along. They're having to make determination as to which branch of the river provides the easiest, uh, easiest movement of the boats upriver. And in fact, on one particular day, they actually laid to the entire day because of the high winds and the weather that they faced. There are a number of other small issues that take place this week historically that are noteworthy. Uh, as I mentioned, we're taking most of our information from Clark's journals at this point. And one of the uh, things that's actually recorded in Clark's journals for this past week was an incident between one of the men and York. At one point uh, on the, uh, I believe it was the 21st or 22nd, the 21st I believe actually, uh, York is actually assaulted evidently by one of the men and we're not sure whether that's done in jest 
or it with uh, and it just to sort of is taken too far or if it was done with uh, in, in malice and there was something deeper and there's uh, not a lot of information but we do know that one of the men threw sand in York's eyes and uh, almost causing a quite serious issue in terms of uh, a, a more more than just a temporary blindness and Clark records that that uh, that indeed York was almost in uh, peril of losing one of his eyes and so that's an incident that's noteworthy as we see the dynamic still unfolding between the members of the Corps of Discovery. Some other things that happened this week, uh, Clark uh, is off the boat as Lewis is on a number of occasions. They're starting to do a, a much more regular uh, exploration of the interior and the surrounding area around the river. On uh, this, this date actually in, uh, in 1804, Clark actually becomes mired in some uh, sand, some almost quicksand like mud that he encounters on one of the islands that he's traversing. They pass a place which is now known as Cooley Lake, which was uh, formed by and left behind by part of an oxbow. And there's, the river has changed its course tremendously where we are from where it was 200 years ago. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But uh, they're starting to explore the interior. Vast herds of deer are being seen in this area. And they're starting to take bear on a regular basis as part of their, uh, their hunting uh, um, expeditions, daily hunting outings. And so the game and wildlife are beginning to play a very, very large role in what they see. Again, I mentioned this last week. There is a note uh, here and there in the journals at this point that they mentioned seeing elk. Indeed, they have not seen elk at this point and uh, they have started to see again snakes are becoming a big part of the story. Clark records uh, killing a snake which he refers to as a, a milk snake and there was a, a common belief that those snakes would suckle the, uh, the milk from uh, pregnant animals or, or animals that were nursing their young yet and in fact in one occasion uh, Druard brings a deer, a doe deer into their camp and Clark records the fact that this he, what he, he appears and much of this seems to be influenced by the folk belief that the uh, snake fed on the milk of these animals and he 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 records killing this snake as it tried to uh, uh, tried to get at the the meat of this doe at any rate that's basically what's happened this past week of course they have yet to encounter any tribal presence of any Native Americans along the way and they will not do that until they reach the plat so essentially at this point the men are moving along they're struggling against the river they're continuing to see an increase in wildlife a number of uh, plants are becoming more and more common the black raspberries for example are recorded repetitively in the journals at this point in fact, this past week, um, I actually spent a, an hour or so gathering raspberries, and our cook, Jim Stanley, included those in our, in our flapjacks for breakfast the other day. And so we, too, like the original expedition, are starting to actually be able to reap the fruit, literally, of the land around us, and we're starting to enjoy some of the, the natural vegetation that we can consume along the way. What we'd like to do now is take a look at some of the footage and some of the things that have happened over the past week. When we came to you last week from Lexington, the boats had not arrived yet. And so we're going to take a look now at some footage of the boats arriving at historic Lexington, Missouri. Here you see the boats coming in. The keel boat's still fully tinted as we were dealing with rain on a regular basis yet last week at this point. The weather's been good. When we got to Lexington, the folks there uh, extended their hospitality. We received the key to the city. And... Uh, as well as a, a very uh, handsome and uh, appreciated donation from the folks of this community who helped make our trip possible by, by the donations that they made here. And the men are very appreciative of that. Here you see some of the other historic sites around the Lexington area that we enjoyed. Was This is the Madonna of the Trail. This is one of a number of these statues that are actually uh, available, or excuse me, not available, but are, are placed around the, the western trails. The Madonna of the Trail uh, commemorates the mother who nursed and cared for their children during the many wagon trains and western uh, excursions and journeys that Americans took as the settlement of the West continued throughout the, uh, the 18th century. One of the other noteworthy uh, items in Lexington that we, we don't have any footage of it, but there is a memorial in uh, Lexington, and it's a noteworthy one for the steamship, the Saluda. The Saluda was a vessel carrying a number of Mormons, a large number of Mormons, uh, westward to Salt Lake City and the uh, the vessel actually exploded near what is now Lexington and uh, a number a large number of the uh, of the pioneer 
Mormons were killed there, and the city of Lexington continues to honor them with a memorial. Interestingly enough, just pa this past week, we passed a, a number of young uh, women from a Mormon school who were on their own expedition. They were making their way down the river from Lexington where they had come to pay tribute to the, the, those lost on the Saluda and were making their way to St. Charles, sort of in their own uh, the combined Lewis and Clark uh, adventure themselves. So the, the story continues uh, for all Americans to find their, their connection to the river and certainly those young ladies were doing that through the story of the Saluda. Lexington, unlike many of the other communities that we have encountered along the river, is a community that's sort of having a resurgence, a, a revitalization. You can see a crane there in the footage, and the town has started to really have a renaissance. Um, we're looking across the street right here at a, this is an, a, an area that's actually starting to be regentrified. The buildings are starting to fill with business again. And so this was a very hopeful note as we passed up the river to start to encounter communities that are thriving again. And here you see the boats after leaving Lexington. We're making our way to Fort Osage, historic Fort Osage, located on a hill that was identified by William Clark when the expedition passed by in 1804. He, in fact, after returning to St. Louis, uh, helped to spearhead the construction of this camp, actually led a group of men to this area, Fort Osage, which is in Sibley, Missouri. Fort Osage was a trading post. It was garrisoned with a military garrison there to protect the traders and uh, to maintain order in this area. They were trading largely with the Osage here, bringing fur in, which would then be transported to St. Louis and ultimately to New Orleans and ultimately perhaps as far as Europe for the fur trade. This is inside the fort and this was a common construction style on the frontier, the stockade fort with the horizontal log uh, blockhouse construction and uh, this, this fort was actually built in 1808. Uh, this is a reconstruction of course but and this is actually only a partial reconstruction. The complex was much larger uh, when the original building was standing there. So we have an opportunity to spend a few days here, and here you're going to see the interior of the, the compound. These are the barracks buildings uh, throughout, and we're going to come around and they have the trade workshops here. We're going to see the, where the folks are standing there is the black shops area. And one great thing about Fort Osage is that it, it is a, a regularly garrisoned his, living history site. They have artisans such as the blacksmith who work there and do living history and demonstrations. And here we're looking at the factory store. This factory store was very important. Things were, uh, this is where the trading would have largely went on. Materials would have been brought up from the river when they were brought up uh, on keelboats from St. Louis, for example, and traded there with the Native Americans for furs. And here we're going to look down from the high hill on which the fort is built toward the waterfront. And here you'll see in just a moment, there are the keelboat and the two pirogues stacked against the cut bank. We'll be talking about cut banks in just a few moments again. And the camp above the cut bank uh, where the boats are docked, tucked into the, the, uh, the hi base of the hill. And this was a nice opportunity for the Discovery Expedition to take a little rest, to prepare weapons and gear. And here you see one of the men, this is Jay Rodkin, who portrays Private Fraser, uh, working on his knapsack, re-lettering and stenciling the, uh, the U.S. on there as we continue to uh, tell the story of the United States Army and the story of Lewis and Clark as we make our way across the country. It was great as we had a few days here. We had an opportunity for once, as we like to do every once in a while when the occasion affords it, to be tourists ourselves. And myself and a number of the men had the opportunity to visit the Harry Truman Presidential Library here in Liberty, Missouri, which is uh, close to where we're located. And uh, this is Michael Devine, who is the president of the uh, Truman Library, Presidential Library. We're here, and this is the research and reading environment here, uh, where scholars from around the country would come to do research. Here we're looking at a Thomas Hart Benton painting that is on the wall in the entry. It's quite beautiful and stunning, telling the story of this region from the Native American perspective all the way through the Western settlement, ultimately up into the 20th century. Thomas Hart Benton, of course, is one of the great, uh, great American painters, and certainly probably Missouri's premier uh, painter as well. And here we are with a life-size statue of President Truman and uh, the men there have enjoyed the opportunity to stop by there and, and have their picture taken with the, the former president. And we were very honored to have an opportunity to take a sort of private tour of what was his working office during the construction of the library when the library was functioning and he was still alive. This is the actual office that he worked in. That picture you saw there was sort of indicative of Truman's style. If, and Michael Devine there is pointing out that when the, this is a picture of Best Truman that Harry had carried all his life and when the 
when the frame broke, he fixed it with paper clips rather than getting a new one. He was a very frugal man. And here we are at the Presidential uh, Library Courtyard. This is the final resting place of President Truman and his wife, Bess. And there you see the eternal flame burning for them. And in just a moment, we'll see their actual gravesite. Truman decided that, uh, that the inside of this complex would be the place that he would like to uh, be interred, and indeed he himself and Bess are buried there today. It's a tremendous facility. We encourage anyone who has the opportunity to stop by when they're passing through this part of the country and take advantage of the Truman Library. It's indeed a, a, a fine, fine example of what a presidential library ought to be, and we're eager to be working with those folks. In fact, we anticipate that this fall we'll probably be doing a video conference related to the, the Office of the Presidency, and we hope to be working with the Truman Library and perhaps some others on that. And we invite educators and students to look forward to that broadcast. Today, as we're going to talk about our special feature, we're going to move into the river itself. Obviously, the river, as I mentioned earlier, 200 years ago, was sort of the, the dominant character in the story. It was what uh, the Corps spent their day engaged in. Native Americans weren't on the scene yet, and, and the, the, the daily toils and tasks were all about moving the boats up the river. Among other things, uh, the river continued to provide the sustenance for the organization, including the, the drinking water and those sorts of things. We're going to be joined today, and we are joined now by Dale Blevins from the USGS, the United States Geological Survey. And Dale, we're happy to have you with us today. Well, thank you. I'm very uh, privileged to be here with you. Enjoyed it very much. Well, one of the things that we're going to do today, Dale is actually going to talk to us about two specific things today. One is how the original expedition was able to, uh, to gauge the current and the speed of the current of the river that they were traveling on, as well as which, of course, helped them to determine how fast they were moving and the mileage they were covering and that sort of thing. We're going to talk about that. We conducted an experiment at Fort Osage just a couple of days ago uh, using the same technology, and Dale will be talking about that. He's also going to be talking to us a little bit later, actually conducting here in front of you live today, a, an experiment dealing with the sediment of the, uh, the, the water and its concentration of sediment in it and things that were referred to in the journal. So first of all, Dale, uh, let's start with, uh, with the, the log line and the log reel here. If you could tell us a little bit about the technology, why we're doing this and, and that sort of thing, and then when we get to it, we'll take a look at the, at the footage from the experiment. Sure, very good. Um, you know, Lewis and Clark were the first ones to tell us how fast the Missouri River really was. And uh, the way that we know that they did that from the journals and then from the journal entries, we also know a lot about how they did it. And uh, we, what they used was something called a log line, which um, uh, was used, actually had been used, and used for 200 years on ocean-going vessels to measure the speed of ships. But what Clark did is he mod modified this log line to measure the speed of the water. And uh, what we have here is we have an example of a log line. Sure, we'll pick that up. Um, what it is, it's just a light rope that's marked off uh, with little ribbons in fathoms. And fathoms are six foot each. And uh, every eight fathoms, there would be a knot, like we have here. And uh, then at the end of the rope, they would tie a stick, like this. And um, this stick would be tossed over the back of the boat, and it would float downstream behind the boat. And as the uh, stick would float, why the rope would reel off the reel. And they, would, they had with them a, a very good timepiece so they could measure the speed of uh, the, how long it took, uh, about 300 feet of rope to go off the reel. Uh, that would be 50 fathoms. So in the journals, they, they actually recorded in fathoms. And so we have velocities from, uh, from that period of time. And that was really important to me because I was wanting to know, you know how their velocities compared with what we measure today at, at some of the exact same locations that they measured. So if, we, if you yeah, want well, to... Yeah, why don't we do that? Let's go ahead and take a look and explain to us what it is we're seeing and what's happening here. Okay, this, like uh, Captain Lewis said, we did this a couple of days ago. Um, and this is, we were right in, out in front of Fort Osage, and we tossed in the log. And right there, we start timing with our stopwatch that uh, I have in my hand. And we're counting uh, the number of uh, knots that come off the reel. And uh, the stopwatch is going. So when we're done, we're going to have a distance, and we're going to have a time. I was just going to point out, the boat is not moving. What we're That's seeing right. is the water moving here. That's right. This is to measure the water. So we're holding the boat stationary. And we're going to have a distance from the rope and a time from the stopwatch. And if you divide uh, the distance by time, you can get a river velocity. Uh, we actually did this twice. Uh, and this first one, I believe, we got here, we got six feet a second, which is really uh, probably close to what we measure today at that, uh, in this part of the river. Uh, so I felt pretty good that that was a, a, a reasonable estimate of the surface velocity of the water. You can see the stopwatch that I've got there on my wrist. 
uh, getting ready to stop it when, when it tightens when we come to the end like that. So we had um, a time and a distance and came about six feet per second, which is, you know, the river's up a little bit when it's back down at its normal stage, it might be more like uh, five, maybe even four feet per second. Uh, so that was, that was pretty accurate. And how did that compare with uh, what we know from the journals 200 years ago? Well, that's really interesting because uh, we, we have a, one of the places, the first place that we have recorded on the Missouri River that Lewis and Clark measured was, actually Clark, was it near present-day Waverly, Missouri. And uh, the velocities that they measured there is about, came to about 12 feet per second in the fastest part of the river. Now they measured it closer to the shore and it got less and less. But in the fastest part of the river, they got 12 feet per second. So I went back and looked at all our measurements that we've made at that location back to 1928 and we measured about once a week. And the fastest we've ever measured there is about 12 feet per second. You know, I've always heard ever since I've uh, been near the Missouri River that it used to be much wider and much shallower and therefore much slower in Lewis and Clark's day. But that measurement and actually some of the ones that followed indicate that it's every bit as fast then as it was now. We don't want to uh, sell short the effort that they made pulling that keelboat up uh, against the current because they did uh, had probably as much current then as they do now. Of course, they could stand up in the river then. There. That's true. <laughs> That's true. They could do a lot of things. And the other thing, the river has a much more even velocity from bank to bank now than it did then. Back then there was a lot more variety, a lot of more eddies that they could find shallow, slower places and maybe even some reverse currents that would help to pull them upstream. Right. In fact, just this week in the journals, they actually talk about a, a, uh, a countercurrent that, uh, that stretched for about a mile, where they were actually taking advantage of a countercurrent to help move the boats up. And as well, at one point this, on this week, historically, Cruzat had been sent out uh, to sort of move among some islands to find a channel that, was, uh, that had slower moving water in it. Right. That, and that was, I'm sure that was a big part of uh, picking their way up the river is finding where, not only where the slowest current was, but where they could actually get through the snags and uh, not uh, get swamped by caving banks, too. So. Well, it's great, and we appreciate the fact that we had the opportunity to, to do that experiment. And I think it's, an, it's interesting, again, we oftentimes will talk about the fact that Clark was so accurate in his measurements in terms of the survey and, and the map making, that sort of thing, as he crossed the country. But it's interesting to note that, that even with this, this simple device here, that we're still able to get measurements that have some, some meaning to them. They they're they're, they're still have some degree of accuracy, and so that's great. And maybe that's something that uh, the teachers can do with their students at some point in, uh, in in the communities you're in on a local stream or something like that, you could conduct an experiment very much like this yourself. We're going to do something else here today live, and why don't we talk about, let, let's talk about first of all why we're doing it and what it is we're doing, and then, and then we can move into the experiment. We're talking about the, the river, and we mentioned cut banks earlier. Why don't we go ahead and expand on that? Yeah, I, one of the things I was also interested in was the amount of sediment in the river in Lewis and Clark's time versus today, because we've done a lot of things to the river. We've, uh, we've narrowed it, we've made it deeper for navigation, We've lined the banks with riprap and wing dikes. And so the character, of course, as you, I'm sure you've told, is, is, is much different than it was. And so I wanted to see if we could see a much difference in the sediment. And we have uh, a few sediment measurements from the journals. There's actually three different ones, and they were done three different ways. But one of them was made uh, just downstream, uh, I'd say maybe 25, 30 miles near a little town called Wellington. Um, I call it the uh, wine glass measurement of sediment. And that's what we're going to do is recreate that. The, the quote in the journal says, um, the water that we drink, or the common water of the Missouri at River at this time, contains half of a common wine glass of mud or ooze per pint of Missouri River water. So when I read that, I was pretty excited. I thought, wow, we actually have a sediment measurement here. I didn't know there was one in the journals. But the problem I had was is that wine glass. You know, I had to know how big that wine glass was to know what the sediment concentration was. And I, to tell you the truth, I kind of almost gave up on it. But when I, uh, I came across the uh, 1800 uh, recipe book from the George Washington family that had been published. And in the back, the editor had put a table that shows common cooking measurements of the time. And one of those measurements, along with a gill and some other old measurements, was a wine glass. And it was only two ounces, which is much smaller than a wine glass that we have. You know, most wine glasses today are six or eight ounces. Well, it was a lot, actually a lot less sediment. So half of a common wine glass, maybe that's why he said common, because everybody knew how big a wine glass was. It was used for... It would be more like a sherry glass, yes, probably. Right. A shot glass, something like right. that. So half of a two-ounce glass would be one ounce. So we had one ounce of sediment per pint of Missouri River water. And what I'd like to do is mix that up for you now to kind of show you what that looks like. Why don't we do that? We can take a... Look at what, what you can you can just if you can continue to explain to us what's sure. happening. Sure, I'm going to be mixing. I'm measuring out. You uh, just collected this today, didn't you? Well, actually, I didn't collect it today, but I did collect it here. 
I collected it uh, last winter right here in front of the site that we're at now. It's Missouri River Sediment. Um, Real quickly, I'd like to remind our viewers that you can continue to uh, to join us today and, and interact with us by email. If you send your emails to Lewis and Clark at Clayton dot k12 dot mo dot us, and we'd be happy to answer your your questions. Once again, that's Lewis and Clark at Clayton dot k12 dot mo dot us. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So I measured out a, an ounce of uh, sediment in this wine glass, and even though my wine glass is too big. Uh, I've got the right amount of sediment. I'd collected it right out here off the uh, sandbar last winter. So it is Missouri River sediment. And I'm going to mix it up in the same proportions then that Lewis and Clark purported, reported it. Looks like chocolate milk, yes, Dale. Absolutely does. And that, you know, even right in the quote that we have, it says that this is the water we drink. So that's a pretty amazing thing. Now, Actually, that probably overstates the, the, uh, the issue a little bit because if you take that and you let it settle for a day, it looks more like this, which, you know, it's, if you drank off the top of that, that wouldn't be quite so gross. In fact, uh, just downstream of here at Call Point, uh, Lewis and Clark, had made, uh, they tasted the Kansas River and the Missouri River, and they liked the taste of the Missouri River water a lot better than the, the Kansas River. So that, that was an amazing amount of sediment. In fact, if th what I was interested in, though, is how does that compare with what we measure today? Because we do measure sediment still in the river. We measured it. We measured it since about 1973 at about five different places, um, about once a month. And I went through all that data to see what the highest concentration that we'd ever ha measured was. And the highest concentration we ever measured was about one fourth of the one that Lewis and Clark reported. So there is less sediment in the river today than there was. That's absolutely. That's right. There is much less sediment. Uh, I really, you know, at first I even kind of doubted whether or not this was an accurate measurement because that's an awful lot of sediment. But uh, it was in, in 1843, uh, John Audubon came through and made a, a similar measurement that was even more sediment than what Lewis and Clark measured. So I feel like that perhaps that indeed was a, a realistic measurement. But the difference, the, the thing, reason we have so much less sediment today, uh, basically there's two big reasons. One is are the dams on the upper river. Uh, there's really no sediment that gets through that last dam at Gavin's Point. So any, any sediment that gets in the river uh, down here has come in below Gavin's Point. And, uh, so we're not bringing, for example, the mineral deposits and things that are, that are above Gavin's Point at Yankton, right. th those kind of the gypsum and things like those, those things are not making their way here. But anything that's particulate settling out in the bottom of those, of those reservoirs. Uh, and then the other thing is, and this is the big thing, and even Clark pointed this out in his journals, the primary source of sediment to the river were the caving banks. And I think we might have actually have a We do. In fact, if we can take a look at that, that uh, this is taken at Fort Osage, which as you and I discussed, is, is one of the great examples of what a vertical cut bank ought to look right. like. Right. And, then, you know, and, and under an active condition, that the water would be undercutting that bank, and the huge pieces of the bank may be falling into the river. In fact, it almost swamped the keelboat a time or two when they were too close, when a huge piece with trees and everything else on it came caving in. Uh, and that supplied huge amounts of the sediment to the river, which we really doesn't happen that much anymore because so much of the banks have been lined with riprap and wing dikes to support navigation channels. And we can see the striation there and uh, all that, that layer of time, just as we would with the limestone bluff, you know, a tremendous amount of diversity in the deposits that are there, that are uh, demonstrated there. Now, I know from, a, I will share this with our audience, but this bank, while it seems like that may be a, a very raw and rough and and, uh, and sort of tough thing to deal with when you come up and you see it. For us, moving the boats, and, and I believe that Lewis and Clark would probably have concurred, certainly they were going through the same process we were here. These banks actually, uh, other than the fear of the, of the, of the actual uh, 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 collapsing uh, soil, these banks actually provide a very nice docking for the boats. And in this area, which they mentioned again that this was an area that had a tremendous amount of current, they were, that, was, that they were fighting, trying to get out of the current, that sort of thing. These were probably a, a, welcome, a welcome sight, these cut banks. So, do you want to go ahead with that? Just one last thing. I was going to show you this. Though. On my left here is the Lewis and Clark sample, and this is one I just pulled out of the river today. You can see the difference in color here, how the, the one t I pulled today is a lot less sediment, even though the river is up some still. Uh, which would actually probably put more sediment in it than normal, but there's a huge, still a huge difference. Well, and I think it's interesting that you bring that up because a lot of times people, you know, words or phrases, comments are made that aren't necessarily uh, uh, very clear. And, you know, people will talk about the fact that the river, you know, 
is dirtier today or something like that. And, and that's not really maybe the truth. There may be a higher concentration of, of some chemical pollutants and things like that. But as we've just seen here, actually the river is less dirty than it was 200 years ago. Which has its own set of problems sometimes because a lot of the fish that evolved here were fish that evolved under very heavy, heavy sediment concentrations did not need to see. So the fish that today might do better are fish that can see and see their prey. Okay, in fact, I'll tell you what, that, that's, that brings up a great idea. One of our email uh, questions that has just come in actually asks about that. What are the environmental concerns because of the changes? Well, that, the fish? Yeah, that is probably one of the main ones is, is that uh, a lot of the uh, fish that evolved, like pallid sturgeon, uh, which are now endangered uh, on the Missouri River, uh, and catfish and some of those things, they were, had great advantages because they really didn't need to see anything. So that okay. was We've got one other question that would I direct to you, Dale, before you, you have to leave us, and that is, what factors affect the river speed? This would go back to the issue of the current. Right. Uh, certainly, the roughness of the bottom and uh, the depth would, would make a difference. And that's why, even though I think that they had maximum velocities back then that were very comparable to what we had today, they did have wide parts of the cross-section in the river that would be shallow and slower. Uh, and so those are the slope and roughness are the two main things. The uh, slope is probably about the same. The river's been shortened a little bit with a few bends been taken out, but not a lot. So the slope is probably about the same. Um, but it's a much smoother bottom now. Yes, that's true. It's got dunes and it's mostly sand, but there's very little uh, trees and things hung up in the bottom of the river. So, so the natural damming that would have occurred, is that's largely gone away. Great. Well, listen, Dale, I certainly appreciate you being with us today. And in just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity. Actually, I would remind our viewers again that if you have questions, please send them to Lewis and Clark at clayton.k12.us. I'll tell you what, we're going to go back to Dale before you get out of here real quickly. If we can uh, bring the camera out and get Dale back in the shot here just a moment. There is a question that's come in. And what that is, it's an excellent question. I apologize for not uh, going into this at the very outset. What is the role of the USGS today? And why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about what the agency does? Okay, well, I guess especially the things that relate to what we've been talking about here today are we have a uh, network of gauging stations uh, along the river that keeps uh, track of the rising and falling of the river stage so you can actually go to the internet and see what rivers are doing at any time and that website is I think it's I think we actually have it linked to us but go ahead well, you can just go to the usgs.gov site and, and then start looking for the real-time um, data and that's where that's where you'll see it so just go to usgs.gov and that'll get you started excellent and, and then the other thing is we do still measure sediment also at all these different stations up and down the river, uh, which is really what got me interested in what the old measurements were like. So. Well, and we've, as we've learned many times, people are, it, it, sometimes it's more surprising what hasn't changed than what has. Right. So thanks again, Dale. We Thank appreciate you. you being here. And we're going to be joined, uh, thanks again, and we're going to be joined now uh, by Captain Cox from the Missouri Water Patrol. One of the things that's been happening as we've moved across Missouri is we've, we've been very fortunate to have uh, the folks from the Water Patrol to move with us for safety reasons, uh, law enforcement concerns. Uh, there are a lot of recreational boaters and that sort of thing. So as we've moved across the country, we have, uh, or ex actually across the state, we've been very, uh, very fortunate. We've been working very closely with the Missouri Water Patrol. And uh, today we're going to be joined by Captain Cox. And so uh, he's, we're getting scared in here, and uh, it's a little tight here under the pavilion. Uh, Captain Cox, thanks for being here with us. Thank you very much. Can you tell us, tell us a little bit, of, uh, if you would, about what the Water Patrol's function is in the state generally? Well, generally, the Missouri State Water Patrol is the same as the Highway Patrol. We just work out of a boat instead of out of, of, out of a car on the highway. Okay, and now I know in, in talking to a number of your patrol officers that are out here, a lot of them are not r normally detailed to this area that we've been traveling through. Is that correct? No, uh, right now we have just over 80 officers assigned to work the waters in the state of Missouri, and we're going to use 72 of them during the event in Missouri. Okay, so some of these guys, are they're being pulled from their regular duty stations? Yes, Lake of the Ozarks, Table Rock, um, Wapapella in the southeast part of the state. Uh, just all over the state. Well, one of the things we've noticed is the fact that there, and there's been a lot of talk about this in the newspapers and everything else for many years, and that is traffic on the Missouri River. And obviously the high water has had an impact these last few weeks, but there's not a, a lot of commercial traffic on the river. And, uh, of course, there hasn't been a, we haven't seen a lot of recreational traffic on the river to date, although I think probably with this weekend in isolated places and then, of course, this weekend uh, with it being the holiday weekend. Um, what is the status of the river with regard to traffic, both commercial and, and recreational? Commercial traffic on the Missouri River is relatively light, as you said. Um, and really, probably the high water has not had any hindrance on that at all. Uh, it's the velocity of the Missouri River is so high that it costs the towboat companies 
considerable amount of money for the fuel to push barges upstream and everything. So it's commercial traffic's relatively light. Um, recreational tra traffic, the same, is pretty light. Um, the St. Charles area usually has quite a bit of traffic, and then from Kansas City upstream, uh, we'll start seeing more recreational traffic. And a lot of that reasoning is due to the close proximity of other areas of the state to our lakes and stuff. Right, and it is it is a, a fast-moving river, and if, when you're at it, you have to really be focused on what you're doing. It's not a place to just, to. It, it's not something to take lightly. No, um, the current is quick. Uh, I grew up on the Mississippi River north of St. Louis, so I'm kind of used to river boating, and I've worked this area in the Kansas City area now for 18 years. Um, but it's it's different boating, and the river's constantly changing. The sand's constantly moving. Our sandbars change all the time. Uh, the Corps of Engineers has put in a lot of rock dikes and revetments to direct the current, so it's a self-scouring channel, so they don't have to maintain navigational channel for the uh, uh, commercial traffic. So you've got to keep your eyes open. You're constantly moving out there. It is, and it is a highway. I mean, I think that's, it may not have a lot of traffic on it, but it really has, uh, to Lewis and Clark, to us, it is a place to you. You can get somewhere on it, but it is a highway, and, and you'd really have to be alert out there. Oh, definitely. Um, as we saw this morning, the two jet skis going down the river, uh, they're going all the way to St. Louis. So exactly, and that's a great segue. I wanted to actually mention that one of the things that we try to underscore in what we do, and we talk to people about it all the time, is is how serious boating is on this river, and how important boating safety is. And obviously, that's a paramount concern for you all as well. Um, this morning, for those of you who are unaware, we're here in the Kansas City area, and there was a local disc jockey who, uh, as part of some promotional stunt or, or however it came to pass, I don't know, uh, he himself and another fellow are going to uh, are, are taking jet skis from the Kansas City area all the way to St. Louis, and they're going to try and do it, I guess, in one one shot. Yeah. And there's a bed of some sort with somebody, right. and. And their deal is to make it to the arch and back to Kansas City in 24 hours. But, you know, I, I just feel sort of obligated as someone who's spending as much time on the river as I am to, to you know, share with people uh, whether, you know, the, the wisdom of, of, their, of their decision today uh, may not be a great one. You know, and, and people in the media have a tremendous amount of influence. And when you hear that someone's doing this, it may seem like a good idea. But quite frankly, these men may not be aware of the dangers that they're facing and the risks that, the, that, that they're up against. Well, like you mentioned earlier, we do have high water right now on the Missouri River, and that masks a lot of the characteristics of the river. The wing dikes and such are all underwater right now. Um, the debris in the river has, has let up quite a bit in the last few days, but I'm sure as they get downstream and the water's coming in from the other tributaries, the Grand River and such, into the Missouri, that water level stays high, so there's a lot of trash out there, a lot of logs and stuff, and it, it's... When they're putting themselves under pressure, uh, they have a tendency not to keep their eye out as close as they should. Right, and so for those of us who are, or for those of us who are, or you folks out there who are watching, we just would reiterate the need for safety on the water, whether it's a lake or a river or whatever. When you're boating, it's something to take very, very seriously. And in our case, and you've heard me say it before, the river does not know it's a reenactment. And sometimes you don't even have to get into the river. Sometimes she'll come up and get you. And so we encourage you, if you're going to be out on any body of water, to take that uh, that seriously. And of course, I'm sure uh, Missouri uh, Water Patrol, you have a website. Yes, we do. And I would encourage folks to, to see that website. In fact, we'll link to that through our site, as well as the Coast Guard site. They have good information there for someone who's a boater and who wants to improve their skills and maintain that high level of safety on the water. Uh, there's nothing to ruin a good day on the river like an accident. So oh, They'd run it quick. And one thing you got to remember is you can't walk away from a boating accident. That is absolutely very well said. Thank you, uh, Captain Cox. And, and moreover, just uh, would like to thank the Missouri Water Patrol for, uh, it's been a, a good long ride. We've got another couple weeks, I guess, to, to spend some time together. About a month. Uh, yeah, yeah. We've, and, uh, <laughs> but it's, it, it is, we're on the other side of the state, and we're, we're headed up the west side. But we've enjoyed the uh, time we spent with your folks and appreciate all the assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're going to try and get out of here now and let you all get back to uh, what other uh, important computing things you need to do today. We're sitting once again today at, uh, at the town of Sugar Creek, Missouri, just outside of Kansas City in La Benite Park. We've got a couple of questions that came in. We'll try to answer them very quickly before we go. There was a question again, and I think I mentioned this about Fort Osage. It was built in 1808, and the question was, was it largely a military or a trading environment there? And it's, uh, it, w it was a trading environment. The purpose of the military there was to act as essentially a police force, as it were. You had uh, these native cultures were joining 
the expedition, or excuse me, joining the, uh, the, uh, the, the native traders were coming down bringing um, goods in. There were traders from New Orleans, a very diverse group of people. And as you might imagine, any time a group of people gets together, there's the potential for conflict. And really the military's purpose there was to create a safe environment and a orderly environment for trade to be conducted between Native Americans and uh, the settlers and trappers and, and all who were making their way past that area. Um, let's see what other questions do we have today. Could Clark's illness be, uh, be from bacteria in the water? Yes, as a matter of fact, if you, this, this question that we just received uh, actually refers to a journal entry. In fact, uh, Clark was not feeling well, and the men were complaining of dysentery, like uh, um, complaints of, and illnesses at this point. And yes, there is a tremendous amount of speculation that there were naturally occurring bacteria that uh, probably caused some sort of uh, issues, uh, bowels and, uh, and uh, gastrointestinal um, in, uh, problems. So yes, that's, that's quite likely that that, that was the case. And you, as you heard Dale Blevins talking about, there was even greater sediment in the river there. Uh, you probably had, a, we know the river was teeming with much more animal life, fish life at that time. And so yes, the likelihood of, uh, of, of some organism being in the river that could have caused a problem is quite high. And now here's a question, I guess, in relationship to the, our, our uh, conversation with the Water Patrol. Do members of the current Corps wear life preservers? The answer to that question is both yes and no. We do not wear them on a regular basis if we are moving under normal circumstances on what we would uh, call a safe water in good weather, that sort of thing. When we're coming into a community where we're doing a, uh, arriving as the Corps of Discovery would have with a military profile and a historic uh, look to the operation, we do not. Our life jackets on the boats are pre-positioned in very uh, convenient places in the event that we do need them. And under certain conditions, we wear them as a matter of practice. For example, uh, anytime we were locking through a, a, a lock uh, Corps of Engineer lock uh, for the safety there. We certainly would wear them there. If we're in bad weather, we wear them at that point. Or if there's some reason to believe that the operation we're engaged in on the river is uh, in any way, even rem there's, there's a remote opportunity for an accident to happen, we will put our vests on. But they are always at the ready, and we certainly would encourage anyone who's out on the river, um, I if, there's, if there's any reason to not wear your vest, that should be the exception. If you're on the river, we would encourage uh, anyone, particularly in small crafts, to have your vest on all the time. What's great is that the uh, boating uh, industry now has provided a large array of different sorts of equipment, and you can get vests, life pres uh, personal flotation devices, PFDs that are very unobtrusive and, and really you wouldn't even know you're wearing them. We'd encourage you to look into those kind of things if you're boating. And always, children particularly, children should always be in a, uh, in a life vest when they're on the water. So we appreciate that question and we want to underscore the need for river and water safety when, anytime you're out there. And uh, one other question that's come in, do we ever run after dark? No, we don't. We have on occasion pulled into a dock uh, after dark as, as the sun was falling and we really avoid that at all costs. We don't have running lights on these boats. We're moving wooden boats and the, the danger from both debris or other river traffic is quite high or just from a rock along the shore trying to land the boat. So basically the, 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 the answer to that question is no. We have come in after dark but we avoid that at all costs and, uh, and uh, anyone who's been on the boat can tell you that it, it's not a particularly enjoyable experience to be on the river after dark without lights. Um, we know what's there during the day and that's, that's uh, a cause enough for concern and when you're trying to move on that water after the sun has gone down it's particularly uh, concerning. Again, we can always take emails from you at Lewis and Clark at clayton.k12.mo.us. Next week, we're going to be broadcasting to you live from Leavenworth, uh, Kansas. We'll be broadcasting from the United States Army Museum of the Frontier, and we look forward to seeing you then. We hope you'll join us for that. These next few days are going to be very exciting as we pass through the Kansas City area, and uh, we hope that you'll have an opportunity, if you live in the area, to partake in some of the bicentennial activities that are in the greater Kansas City area. We encourage you to come out. I'll 
otherwise join us online as we continue to bring the story of Lewis and Clark and the story of the Discovery Expedition to you via our online presence. Again, regular journal entries and photographs can be seen at lewisandclark.net. And of course, all of the broadcasts will be archived here at ali.apple.com slash lewisandclark. Once again, we thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next week. And until then, we proceed on.